Obviously, what you're seeing here are two blood vessels, one normal, and the other on your right, obviously, is seriously diseased. That amount of disease has taken decades to form. Inside that disease is muscle, cholesterol, calcium, and really a lot of inflammation. And you're probably saying, you know, when that small opening finally closes, there's going to be a heart attack. Well, interestingly enough, probably not. Only about 10% of heart attacks come from something which is this nasty. Oh, yes. No question. This patient's probably going to have angina, chest pain. It's going to have also uh, shortness of breath. But heart attack, not so much. Why? Because this has taken so long to form that the body itself has started to make its own bypass. That is to say, not infrequently, when you do an angiogram and you're looking at the blood vessels to the heart, you can see that one of the three major arteries may be completely 100% closed off, and yet the patient will not have had a heart attack. Why? Because as the downstream heart muscle has been slowly deprived of its oxygen and nutrients, it begins to build these tiny little threads of what we call collaterals that go around that blockage and will nourish the downstream heart muscle, which is being deprived of its usual amount of blood supply. And what happens is therefore, the amount of that blood supply through the body's own bypass is enough to sustain the downstream heart muscle viability that even when the thing, that, that is the blood vessel finally closes off, there'll still be enough blood so that that downstream heart muscle will not, will not die. But I wanna have you focus now on the artery on the left, the normal one. And the key here for you to take away is the name of that delicate innermost lining that hopefully those of you, <laughs> even in the back of the room, that delicate innermost lining has a name. It's called the endothelium. And each individual cell is an endothelial cell. cell and that is probably now the, the most important group of molecules that we're gonna be discussing today. There, if you get nothing else from this presentation, there are two words I want you to take home. One is the endothelium and the two we're about to hear from in a moment. But what seems to happen, if you will look here on the figure on the left, when you are eating the cheeseburger, the milkshake, the pizza, the first thing that starts to happen in your bloodstream is those cellular elements begin to get sticky, sticky, sticky. Your endothelial cells get sticky. Your platelets, your clotting factor gets sticky. Your white blood cells get sticky. Your LDL cholesterol gets sticky. But now, here is a slide that I've borrowed from Peter Libby of Harvard. Yes, I know some of you know that I went to Yale, but that's fine. <laughs> Yale man always had a great admiration for Harvard. Now, let's make some sense out of this. First, you're, the blue area you're looking out is the flowing blood. And if we together go over to the hot, far left upper hand corner there, you will see those orange molecules are the LDL cholesterol in the bloodstream. And the blood in the blue is separated from the artery wall by those single little purple cells going across. Those are the endothelial cells. Let's go back to the upper left. Those orange LDL cholesterol particles are now sticky. They bump up against the sticky endothelium and they find a crack or fissure or an opening and they migrate into the subendothelial space where they do not belong. And that when that happens, they become oxidized. So Peter Levy from Harvard here has now changed the color of the LDL cholesterol from orange to yellow to indicate that these are now a small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL particle. 
And inasmuch as the subendothelial space does not like this, it calls upon the SWAT team, which are usually our white blood cells, but Peter Libby from Harvard has painted them here blue in honor of Yale, and we like that. But let's follow that. You can see the SWAT team is coming across as this blue molecule, and it is now doing its job of gobbling up, gobbling up like Pac-Man as it goes from left to right, gobbling up all those small, hard, dense LDL particles until we get all the way over here to the right, where that macrophage or that SWAT particle is now completely chock full of these small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL particles. And that is when we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name. It is now called the foam cell. And the foam cell is truly the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. Why? Because the foam cell manufactures these nasty, nasty substances we call metalloproteinases such as tromelicin, elastase, collagenase, myeloperoxidase. What do they do that's so bad? The metalloproteinases progressively will erode. Let's look at the figure on the left here. You can see the cap over this plaque, especially at its upper portion. It has been eroded and it's gotten thinner and thinner and thinner so that now the sheer force of rushing blood over that thinned out cap, tears it. And this is an absolute seminal moment. You have now ruptured your plaque. Once you have ruptured your plaque, this allows the material inside the plaque to extravasate or ooze out, if you will, into the flowing blood. Whereupon we can now go to figure number B in the middle because that extravasation of plaque content has activated our clotting factors like platelets. And you can see in the middle figure, a clot begins to form. Now the clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, we go from B all the way over to the figure on the right, C. And now look, the clot is completely blocking all the artery. Suddenly, with no time for collaterals to develop, all the downstream heart muscle is immediately deprived of all its blood supply with oxygen and nutrients, it starts to die. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is 90% of how heart attacks form. Now, if I do my job with you correctly today, every one of you and hopefully your friends and relatives can become Heart attack proof, all right? How are you gonna do that? Well, we're not gonna do it with another drug or a pill. We're not gonna do it with a stent or a bypass, but we are going to do it by changing your biochemistry. How are we gonna change your biochemistry? By whole food, plant-based nutrition. When that happens and we change your biochemistry, this entire sequence of events that I've just described for you will be eliminated. You will not have your cellular elements in your bloodstream get sticky when you're eating plant-based food. You will not have a migration of your LDL cholesterol into the subendothelial space. You will not have the arrival of the SWAT team. You will not have the, the development of the foam cell. And if there is no foam cell, then you're not gonna be shrinking the cap over your plaque. And if the cap over your plaque does not weaken and it becomes stronger and it cannot rupture, if you cannot rupture the cap over your plaque, you have made yourself heart attack proof. How long should that take? We think about three weeks and I'll try to show you how that's arrived at. Now forget the x-ray on this slide, but I want you to focus on what the artist has drawn here with an artery where it's half filled with plaque 
and the other half is uh, open. And you can see in the open half, the innermost lining of those pronounced cells, those white cells, that's the endothelial cell. Now the endothelial cell has an interesting history. Up until 1980, we in medicine used to think of the endothelial cell as nothing more than sort of a cute red brick that was lining these wonderful vascular pipes of ours, covering, believe it or not, covering about uh, eight tennis courts, if you spread them all out thin, for 60,000 miles. Pretty, uh, pretty important structure. But that idea that it was just sort of a red brick lining our pipes stopped in 1980, when at this point, Dr. Frischgott, working in Brooklyn, uh, <clears throat> was taking the largest blood vessel from a rodent, the aorta. And he would do this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut on it right through the endothelium, immerse it in saline, and it would constrict. But one day, one day, Dr. Frischgott did not do the cut on the aorta, no injury to the endothelium and immersed it and it would dilate. Did it again with another, dilate. So now suddenly the race was on globally. What was the EDRF that Dr. Fershgott had discovered? Endothelial derived relaxation factor. <laughs> kind of rolls right off your tongue. Fortunately, that term was with us only eight years because at the end of eight years, Dr. Fershgott, Dr. Murad, Dr. Luignaro discovered that the EDRF was indeed a gas, nitric oxide. That's the second word that I want you to embrace today. Now, those three men in 1998 received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of nitric oxide. Now, what is it about nitric oxide that makes it worthy of a Nobel Prize? What are its functions? Its functions are the salvation and the protection of all of our blood vessels. For example, nitric oxide will keep all those cellular elements within our bloodstream <coughs> flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro keeps things from getting sticky, sticky, sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in, in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed, protect, protect us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four. Now, number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaque. So literally, if that's the case, everybody on the planet Earth who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because by now, in the previous decades, they have so significantly trashed injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages in plaque. However, the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get persons to understand that never never ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further injure their endothelial production of nitric oxide, then the endothelium begins to recover, will make enough nitric oxide so we can not only halt disease progression, but we often see significant elements of disease reversal. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that I think is important is probably right now, 
probably right now a number of you are saying, I wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. Well, <laughs> how does that uh, get measured? Well, we really don't have a good method in our office yet, but I want to share with you how it's done on a research basis. If you take an ultrasound probe and place it over your brachial artery at your elbow, there is the readout on the screen of that diameter of your brachial artery. Then for five minutes, you encircle your upper arm with a blood pressure cuff that you inflate to above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, you have absolutely zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. Yes, uh, I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming, <laughs> but then you release the cuff and immediately take the ultrasound probe and again, remeasure the new diameter of the brachial artery. And in the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater because of all the outpouring of that uh, wonderful uh, nitric oxide from when the tourniquet is on. All right. Now, <clears throat> the next great thing that happened with nitric oxide was when Dr. Vogel, Robert Vogel was chairman of cardiology at the University of Maryland. When he took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that was characterized by arches which are real golden, half of them got the cornflakes, their brachial artery tourniquet test, normal. Now the other half had the hash browns and sausage. And within 120 minutes of eating that meal, with the brachial artery tourniquet test, they could not dilate the artery. That single meal had so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned that endothelial system into a train wreck that they couldn't dilate the artery. However, being young, as they followed them into the late afternoon, early evening, they began to recover. And <clears throat> yet you and I know that the next morning for breakfast, it's gonna be scrambled eggs and bacon. Lunchtime, it'll probably be white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. And then at supper time, we'll have baked potato with sour cream, lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on a salad and ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, starting as kids, youngsters, we just take those endothelial cells and we crush them and we beat them and we destroy them. And it's no great mystery why it is that we have such an epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Now, this happens to be just a little slide I borrowed from the Mayo Clinic. And it just sort of summarizes a lot of the bodily dysfunctions that occur when we have endothelial injury and problems, such as sleep apnea, periodontitis, metabolic syndrome, osteoporosis, erectile dysfunction, cerebrovascular disease, dementia, coronary heart disease, heart failure, sudden death, atrial fibrillation, atrial thrombosis, renal failure, claudication, and venous thrombosis. Quite a list of items there. Now I want to summarize just with you briefly what the functions are that we've just discussed that are so really magical about nitric oxide. Nitri it is not nitrous oxide, it is nitric oxide. Prevents the stickiness in our cellular elements in the bloodstream. Strongest vasodilator, avoids arterial thickening, prevents blockages, prevents smooth muscle migration into the wall of the artery, and it can destroy Darth Vader, the foam cell. Now, although we, uh, if we had time, we would discuss all four of these absolutely magical uh, defense mechanisms that the body has, but we are going to discuss the endothelial cell. But I want you to know that the other three, the endothelial progenitor cell, the HDL cholesterol and the dimethyl arginine dimethyl aminohydrolase, all of those, all four 
are going to be absolutely optimized when you are eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. 